Azure Container Apps with Kindle Roden. The Azure DevOps Podcast is a show for developers and DevOps professionals shipping software using Microsoft technologies. Each show brings you hard-hitting interviews with industry experts, innovating better methods, and sharing success stories. Listen on to learn how to increase quality, ship quickly, and operate well. And now your host, Jeffrey Palermo. Welcome to the show. I'm Jeffrey Palermo, your host for helping you and your teams move fast, deliver quality, and run your software with confidence in Azure, all while using everything that the .NET ecosystem has to offer. The podcast is sponsored by ClearMeasure. We're really grateful for them. They're a software architecture company that empowers .NET teams to be self-sufficient and able to deliver world-class results. They are hiring architects as well as .NET engineers who'd like a path to become an architect. So check them out, clearmeasure.com slash careers. My guest today on the show is repeat guest, Kendall Roden. She is a senior product manager for Azure Container Apps. She uh, based out of Austin, Texas. And when she's not working, Kendall enjoys being outdoors, teaching spin classes, and hanging out with her cat, Coda. And uh, you can you can check out episode 137 um, in the archives. Uh, so we're happy to have her on the show. How are you, Kendall? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, I know this is a, a podcast, but Coda's right here with me. So uh, he's close by, ready for the episode, I'm sure. Nice. I, I think he looks a little tired, so hopefully we'll get him awake. But I'm good. Uh, yesterday was actually my 28th birthday. Oh, happy so, birthday. Yeah, thank you. And I hit my six-year anniversary with Microsoft, so uh, lots to celebrate. But yeah, doing well. Happy to be here. Really enjoyed coming on last time. Um, you know, as you mentioned, I've uh, switched into a new role working on container apps now. So happy to be here and, and talk about the technology. Super, super excited. Yeah. Time flies. And you did some speaking uh, with the Microsoft Build Conference. And so, yeah, you you don't slow down, do you? <laughs> it was busy. Build was busy. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, Azure Container Apps actually went general availab- availability at Build. Uh, so that was just a couple of months ago now. Um And so it was a big, it was a big push, really exciting time, just being able to actually take the product from all of the preview stages into actually being production ready for your workloads. So yes. And then I took a nice vacation, went to Europe because I deserved it, obviously. And then now I'm right back into it. So the best reason to take a vacation is because you can. Yes, it was nice. It was good. Well-deserved. Well, so I, I really look forward to asking you about Azure Container Apps, uh, for those who who did not catch you on on episode 137, um, I always like to ask, uh, you know, you've been at Microsoft for over six years, but what are the the key points that stand out in your mind in your career that's kind of steered you in, in the direction and landed you on what you're what you're working with today? It's a great question. And I think I can attribute a lot of my career path to being dedicated to just being excellent wherever I was. I started in consulting C sharp development. I think that really built my skill set in A, just having some customer empathy and really understanding pain points that our developers are actually experiencing, especially when it comes to like using our products and trying to be productive. So I think having that dev experience, really being able to understand the perspective of someone who is new to development, which I was at the time and trying to learn a new technology. Um, So I think you know, really enjoyed that, got the technical chops. And then from there, moving into more of the architecture space, the the Kubernetes and containers boom really was what I think has catapulted my career direction. And it wasn't necessarily because I was super passionate about containers. It was because there was a need and I was willing to kind of learn what that new technology was and step into that need and, and fulfill that for my team. And so I think I would encourage you if you're early in your career, um, which I don't know if I can say that anymore since I'm six years in, but I was at the time just being willing to explore new technology, even if even if it makes you uncomfortable and lean in as much as you can to opportunities for technical training. Because I think even if you want to move into you know sales roles or um, less technical roles down the line, having that experience of um, of really being in the tech helps you have that empathy, have that customer understanding when the time comes, um, and also just having that technical depth and knowledge as well. So when Kubernetes blew up, when containers blew up, and they had a need, 
uh, it sort of put me on this path toward architecture, which is when I came onto the podcast last time as a GBB, it was really, how do we do cloud native architecture in Azure? And I, I think what made a big difference was when I hit five years, which would have been a year ago, I started thinking about what were the parts of my job that I enjoyed the most. And I realized it was opportunities to connect directly with customers, opportunities to have impact on the, the ways that we make developers' lives better, the way that we build product with customers in mind. And especially based on the experience I had in the field, uh, being able to translate that into something actionable that we could then implement you know, for our customers. And so uh, when I when I heard that there was a role open that required knowledge of micro, uh, microservices, Kubernetes, and Dapper, which was my favorite open source project at the time, just mm-hmm. happened to be. Um, when I saw that skill set, there was no question in my mind that it was a good fit for me. And the fact that it was in product really took some of those things that I loved and, and made them the core focus of my job. And so it really, it was a combination of luck, uh, you know, putting some effort in to really analyze what I wanted to do, but that's how I got where I am today. And so just want to encourage you, you know, wherever you are in your career, definitely let the, let the current take you, uh, you know, where it may and be open to that. But then at a certain point, make sure that you're reflecting on the things you really enjoy and kind of figuring out what are target opportunities where you can make that the majority of your core focus. Um, and, and I think product management management for me is the right place to be. I don't know if I'll ever, I don't know if I'll ever transition out of this space. Cause I, I think it's so exciting and, and really fun and yeah. a good use of the the background that I have. There's two two words that get thrown out around a lot. That's dev and ops. And if I if I think of all the stuff around Azure and the different services, it's definitely about operating some application that we've developed. And mm-hmm. and so uh, in in your mind, do, can you can you trace back what what sucked you into working on some things that are more in running applications versus the things like there's so many teams at Microsoft that are doing frameworks for building applications. And and there's, I mean, there's huge amounts of work that need to be done on both sides. Yeah, it's a good point. And I really think it's, it's such an end to end journey, but that's, that's one thing that I think with the way that the industry is moving and the levels of abstractions that we're building, I think ultimately at the end of the day, even if you're in operations at an organization, your overall objective is to help developers uh, be more productive and focus on what's making the company money, which is actually writing business logic and you know proprietary software that's going to you know hopefully you know make the company money and help them operate on what their core value proposition is for their customers. And so, I think um, you know I'm working on things that are maybe lower level than just you know focused on developer, but I think developer ops, all of the different personas are definitely part of this entire engineering process. So. When we're building container apps, it's not just about how do we operationalize Kubernetes or how do we um, make it easy for customers to operationalize a product. Um, I I think that's an aspect, but I think the objective of that is let's try to, uh, I don't know, unlock productivity productivity for ops and for developers within an organization so that they can focus on what makes the company money. And so, um, or honestly, what they enjoy doing or, or what they signed up for. So I think from an operations perspective, I will say like, there are so many features that we build and we have to think about each persona as part of that. So yes, I have the developer experience, but apps that are not hosted anywhere, apps that are not accessible from a networking perspective are like moot, right? Like there's, there's no, there's no app really without the operations aspect, without the networking aspect, without the ability to upgrade, update, be proactive, be productive. And so I think we're really just trying to lower barrier to entry, um, with container apps. We're trying to make it easier for developers to focus on their apps using, you know, whatever language framework they want. And then we're really trying to lower the barrier to entry, or excuse me, I would say the the maintenance, uh, the maintenance, maintenance overhead for operations teams, because yeah. not every operations team or not every development organization has a large operations team. They need that to, uh, they need that to not be so cumbersome that they actually can't get their apps up and running quickly. And so I mean, you know, that was a lot of ramble, but I just think it goes hand in hand. And I think we think about these different personas in every feature that we design. There's no feature that's like, oh, I'm only thinking about how the developer is going to be impacted by this. We think about, okay, well, once the feature is built, how can we actually make sure that a company that has security and governance requirements can actually make use of it, right? It's great if 
you can just develop something and throw it on any platform. But a lot of these companies have a lot of constraints that still have to be met. Um, and we just want to make that easier for them to, to accomplish. Sure. Sure. Well, so let's dig into to Azure Container Apps uh, because at Microsoft Build, you know, big announcement. Okay, GA and a preview before, <laughs> but we've had Azure Container Instance, you know, ACI, and then AKS, Azure Kubernetes Service, and and App Service, and and Linux containers and Windows containers. So we got to define it first. Okay, something yeah. went GA, and so you know, for the for the developers that are just like, wait, wait, I heard something. I don't think about this every day. What the heck is it and how is it different from other, you know, things that have had the word container in them before? Sure. Yeah. It's a, it's a, probably the hottest question that anyone will ask is like, what the heck is this? How does it compare to everything else? Um, I do want to caveat and just say in the world of cloud, I think we can all agree. Sometimes we can get analysis paralysis because there's so many different services out there, so many different platforms. So trying to target the right one for us can be challenging, but at the same time, that flexibility is what's nice about the cloud, right? As you have a suite and an array of things that you can choose from, and there's going to be trade-offs with all of them, right? Like no matter what platform you go with, there's going to be things that another platform may or may not have that you need. And so you're always, it's always going to be an evaluation. So I don't want to come on here and say blanket, like container apps is here to like be the only, you know, container hosting platform, right, you know, right. that was not our objective. It's really to fit in line with some of these other services, meet gaps where we we see them in terms of um, getting containers up and running on Azure. Um, and hopefully the plethora of options that are available will help customers who have specific needs find the, the right solution and customers who have more um, you know, broad needs, uh, maybe have a couple of options, right? Whatever might be you know, best for them. So I'll, I'll kind of start with how how I think of where container apps fits into this spectrum. And I'll try to be as concise as possible, but if you think about app service, I think it's one of the most well-known services in Azure, it makes it really easy for you to host your web applications. It has a lot of really great management capabilities. It's truly a PaaS platform, right? Platform as a service. We're managing a lot of the underlying uh, you know, compute and uh, we abstract away a lot of the complexity so that you can focus on getting your web app into you know, app service quickly. And that's also not just some of that operational burden that we're taking on, but the, bel the bells and whistles that we add on top to make connecting to other Azure services easier, securing your application, uh, connecting to you know, your own private virtual network, making sure that you can talk to databases if you want to use app config, key vault for secrets. Like We make it really easy for you to consume the power of all of the different Azure services. So that's a that's you know a great platform it's tried and true we have great consumption customers are typically very happy with it and we continue to provide additional capability that makes that even more compelling so you have the service that's been like a gold standard in my opinion for what an azure service should look yeah, like yeah. and then we have this meteoric rise of containerization and kubernetes so Obviously, we want to provide as many experiences in Azure that allow developers to run their applications the way that they see best fit. And I would say keeping operations in, in mind as well, we try to optimize that experience through you know, tooling and, and integration uh, on the DevOps side and stuff like that. And, and so when you look at containers and Kubernetes, they're complicated. Just I don't think anyone would disagree with you. I don't think anybody that's even an expert in Kubernetes, I think they would even say more so than somebody who's a novice how complicated it is. So yeah. it's something that even once you learn it, even as you get into it, you're just going to have more and more to learn, right? It's not one of those things where you're like, oh yeah, I know everything about it because it's evolving quickly. It's, uh, you know, you're always going to meet a new challenge, whether that's scaling out, taking advantage of new capabilities. Yeah. Um, I think of it as a, a, a F-35 fighter jet controls when you need to go to the grocery store to get some milk. Yeah, like it's complicated. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So so containers, Kubernetes, and there's valid reasons, like especially from an ops perspective to go with containers. And like, I think I've used this before, but as a, you know, I started out as a developer straight out of college. And I remember we would have some releases that everything looked good in one environment, not so good in another one because we were missing some of the dependencies from the Excel spreadsheet, right? Like the appropriate things didn't get loaded onto the virtual machine. Therefore the app wasn't running the way we expected. And so I really think containers came to make DevOps easier, right? Packaging the application, all of its dependencies together, making it super easy to deploy that across different environments. So I think like there are definitely compelling reasons to move toward containers. There are compelling reasons to adopt microservices for scalability, DevOps purposes, 
And then, you know, Kubernetes has become the de facto orchestrator. There were, there are a ton of other orchestrators out there, or at least other uh, like Kubernetes abstractions as well. But at the end of the day, you know, if you think about things like um, Mesosphere DCOS, I think had, you know, their own Kubernetes flavor. And then we had Docker Swarm, all of these orchestration kind of platforms, which made managing these really valuable uh, technologies like containers at scale, you know, makes manning, managing those and running them at scale easier. Um, but Kubernetes won out because frankly, when you're trying to accomplish that, it was the one that had you know the most capability. Mm-hmm. It got the most traction coming out of Google. So with this major movement, we have to understand how we can provide a great experience for Kubernetes in Azure. And I think AKS was a great uh, start to that, uh, you know, that journey. I think if you're looking for a managed service, I truly think Azure Kubernetes service has grown and evolved in such an incredible way, worked with so many customers on that platform. And just to see what they've done in a short period of time really is amazing. And they've made it a lot easier to consume and use Kubernetes without taking away the benefits of the upstream um, capabilities. So a lot of what you can do in upstream, it's being translated very quickly into AKS and you get a lot of feature parity, which is amazing. But that doesn't necessarily lower the learning curve. It doesn't mean that customers aren't still having to operate a lot of the platform. So while you're looking at something like app service, which is a PaaS offering. You can't really compare it to something like an AKS, even though it's a managed service. I would say it's more of like a CAS, which is like containers as a service, or it's like a IaaS plus plus, because there's still a good level of in, uh, yeah. infrastructure knowledge you have to have. You have to know a lot of what a container is. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and how to manage it at scale. And it's, it's, you have to learn a lot about open source Kubernetes constructs. How do we do manifest? How do we adopt these open source technologies that run on top of Kubernetes? So there's just, there's a lot there. So to your point, right? Like I'm a customer, I come to Azure, I see app service, which has, you know, app service for containers, but doesn't really give me the kind of scale or granularity of like a Kubernetes. Um, and then I look at AKS and I'm like, okay, but that's like a lot to take on for maybe a smaller app workload or for a smaller team. And so you start evaluating other options in Azure for hosting containers. A good example of that being something like ACI. So you would see some customers who would evaluate like, oh, I'm looking at Kubernetes service or I'm looking at something like container instances. But in my opinion, the good a good use case for container instances is when you don't need an orchestrator. So if you're looking for things like self-healing or auto scale, you won't get that with ACI. So it wasn't yeah. really like, a super great comparison to say like, oh, I, you know, I want an orchestrator. I kind of want this high scale. I want this, uh, you know, self-healing. I want these capabilities. Um, like if you, ACI wasn't a good uh, comparable technology to then move to if you had some of those requirements. Um, so what I would say for ACI is if you're running things on a local Docker host on a VM and you want to translate that for the benefits of containerization, right? That portability aspect, um, or if you want to run it on you know multiple platforms and you want to run it in that same sort of package, then instead of running it on a VM that you have to manage yourself, give it to Azure, run it on ACI. Don't worry about the VM maintenance, right? So you get that Docker host, you can easily spin up that container and you're good to go, right? You get a consumption model, you still get some of the networking capabilities. So like, it's really good to me for those situations, but uh, we created container apps really to solve what I feel like is a gap in that uh, end-to-end puzzle that I was just talking about, right? We know customers love PaaS. We know customers love Kubernetes, um, but we know that there are barriers to entry for Kubernetes. And we know that some of the feature gaps can't be met, at least with container instances, which still fulfills a very good need for some customers. So that's where container apps, in my opinion, really fits into this picture. Customers want that underlying Kubernetes uh, infrastructure. They want some of those benefits. They want a level of app portability, but they want a more PaaS-like experience like you would get with an app service. And uh, we've seen really great traction in serverless technologies. So marrying the fact that we can now have a consumption-based model on top of Kubernetes um, that looks a little bit like the virtual node concept um, in AKS, but literally your whole cluster just looks like an abstracted, uh, you know, node, which is great. And, uh, and on top of that, we manage a lot of that underlying operational overhead that you would have to manage, even if you were to go to something like an AKS. So, yeah, I mean, we just want to make it really easy to take microservices and containers and get them up and running on a managed platform in, in, in Azure. And I think, I think we've accomplished that uh, in my opinion. Okay. So, Azure Container Apps, just is it yeah. is it 
Linux only? Is it Linux and Windows containers? Today it's Linux. Um, so if you wanted to use Windows, you'd either have to do like AKS with a Windows okay. node pool, or you could do uh, app service for containers and run like a .NET full framework, you know, app, or you could even do ACI, which also supports Windows. But today it's okay. specifically Linux. Now you're using the word today. Does that mean that <laughs> you are actually working on adapting Windows containers? Okay. So no, we are not. Okay. Like today, I, we don't have this on our roadmap. It's not a committed item. So I want to be really clear on that, but I do like caveating anything with like what, you know, who knows what happens down the line. Well, sure. We're pretty solid now for now that that will not be something that's on our roadmap anytime in the near future. But I'm just, uh, I say today and that, you know, who knows what's going to happen right. down the line, right? I can't predict what the needs might be or how Azure might evolve. Um, but yeah, as of right now, our uh, core focus is on Linux containers. I think we've heard that from lots of play. I just wanted to confirm and yeah. I mean, even Windows with the subsystem for Linux and .NET, .NET Core five six. Yeah, there's so many. There's so many server side applications where, okay, do I really have a non Linux compatible dependency? And more yeah. and more architectures, you know, we're finding that you know what? No, I don't have any dependent. I don't care. Let it run. At, at some point, I might not care that it happens to be a different operating system. I really cared about a runtime that I understood. And now the right. runtime happens to work on a Linux operating system. So that's cool. Yeah. And I think there's just different caveats with windows containers that, uh, at the platform level that just, you know, even just from like image pool time and things like that, that just won't give us much of an optimal experience, but it's, there's still definitely validity to the demand. Um, so we, we hear that, but I, I think there's, what's nice is there are other great options in our portfolio that do support that. And so, you know, sure. we're not leaving you in a, you know, in a position where it's like, Oh, well, where am I going to put my windows container? Well, right. any, literally any other container hosting platform on, on uh, Azure right now supports that. So. Many thanks to our podcast sponsor, Clear Measure. Clear Measure is a software architecture company that empowers clients' development teams to be self-sufficient, moving fast, delivering quality, and running their systems with confidence. Whether starting a new project or developing new technologies or techniques, Clear Measure sets up your team to deliver world-class results. Learn more at www.clearmeasure.com. Clear Measure, empowering software delivery. Well, let me ask you about um, dependencies. So Azure Container Apps came about because there was some, you know, some lacking, some gaps in the other offerings that uh, with, with app service, one of the, one of the canonical examples, oh, do I choose a, a VM or do I go to app service was, well, if you absolutely have a dependency that app service can't support, okay, then you have to use a VM. But if you don't have any of those, oh, just use it on an app service. Like for instance, if you were doing special barcode fonts. That's one of the things where, oh, you, you can't install <laughs> custom fonts on an app service instance. And so yeah. you couldn't use app service. But now with, with container apps, how, how does that dependency, do you have more control in, in, in container apps than you did in app service? Or does that, is that limitation still the same? So I'm not aware of the list of like dependencies that you mentioned for app service. Like I don't have a, you know, that list available, but what I would say in terms of like, are we really prescriptive about what you can run in container apps? If you can run it in a Linux based container, um, it, and on a Docker host, then hypothetically it should be able to run in container apps. Um, there are a couple of caveats, things like if you need privileged containers, we don't support running containers as root basically, um, or like with privilege escalation, things like that. Um, we, like I said, we don't support windows containers, but within the Linux paradigm, we don't like dictate a particular base image. It's not like you have to, it's not like a, you know, we have an opinionated runtime like Azure functions. So, um, you know, outside of maybe some workload types that we don't have the full feature set that I think would make running those optimal. Like for example, we don't expose, uh, like disc mounts today. Like you can't mount a disk to your container app. So if you really needed like to mount a disk for like hardcore processing or like maybe some machine learning workloads, um, like that would be a good case where like maybe you would still want to run that in AKS. Um, or, Does that you know, include if Azure files, like from, from an Azure storage account mounting it as a drive? So you can mount an, you can mount Azure files, okay. but you can't mount disk. So it's, mm. it's more just like, there's going to be little caveats like that in terms of like what's exposed in container apps, what may or may not be exposed down the line. And so, um, yeah, so I, I would say it's really less about 
the workload itself and more just like what are some of the maybe dependencies that you have end to end and could container apps provide you that capability? Um, and if not, maybe that would, you know, m- you would have to, to mitigate by going to AKS instead of container apps. Um, so yeah, I can't think of any other, like, I know that the privileged escalation, I know the windows containers, um, you know, maybe something like disc or, uh, but I can't think of any like specific workload constraints that I, uh, off the top of my head that I'm like, oh yeah, we can't support like that kind of Linux container. Like there, there's, okay. there's, um, you know, nice. you know, none that I'm aware of. Nice. But. So, um, I'm, I'm always thinking of the rules of thumb guidance and there is, and of course there's always going to be exceptions, but there's a lot of applications that have an architecture where it maybe it uses you know, SQL database or, or Cosmos or some other data store in Azure there that, that have, that have gone cloud native. This, okay, everything's going to be in Azure and we're using one of the Azure data storage services. And I have, I have a, a backend process that's doing something. And then I have maybe some web pages, some web services, and it's running and it's running an app service. Um, and my dependencies are either Azure queues or signal our service or calling somebody else's web service for, and there's massive amounts of, of applications that are kind of built of those piece parts. Is this something in your opinion that is likely to become the new normal hosting model? Whereas, you know, Azure, Azure app service has, is, is a massive, <laughs> is a massive service. It hosts so many applications, you know, it's, it's almost like the normal, you know, quote unquote, normal, you might have other stuff, but you always have an app service. So yeah, if you're asking if I think that container apps will kind of become like a de facto standard for some customers or as a, like a staple service in Azure, I definitely do. Right. I'm a little bit biased because that's my job, right? I, this is, this is a service that I really believe in, but yes, I can imagine, um, a future where container apps is a, um, like a first, like truly like a, a I wouldn't say first class citizen in Azure because it already is, but where I see it being a, like a household service, for example, where we see a lot more customers that are gravitating toward container apps. Um, you know, and I, I didn't really even just like explain the service at a high level. I talked a little bit about it, but I mean, for anyone who's just completely like, okay, you told us where it fits in, but what exactly is it? It's like, it's, um, it's a platform as a service model that makes it easy for you to take your containers and run them on top of a consumption based like serverless containers you know platform that's basically what it is and we provide a lot of you know bells and whistles on top of that to connect to other azure services and we'll see more and more of that and i think we'll see uh we've seen a trend in azure you'll even see some of the build announcements where we are making our services a lot more like event driven and making it really kind of fit into that event-driven architecture where you can easily hook up to other uh, services within Azure. You can do more event-driven processing and applications that, you know, scale based on on events in a queue or in a topic. And so we've like really baked that into how we built container apps, which is why we have native scale to zero. We've actually taken the Kubernetes event-driven autoscaler project, which is called CADA for short. Um, You can run that on top of AKS or any other Kubernetes uh, like distribution or service, but um, we've taken that and like built it directly into our service. So that means now you get event-driven auto scale for like, Hey, I want to scale based on a queue, a Kafka stream. I can scale based on, you know, a a wide array of different scale triggers, not just like H uh, not just, um, HTTP requests or CPU and memory, right? So we're really like baking that concept of like, we are going to have other services running and like, we're going to have data in this, you know, in this pipeline. And we want our apps to be really responsive to that. And we want them to scale alongside of these, this more distributed event-driven architecture style, you know, uh, right actions that are taking place. And, and we also built in Dapper um, on the platform and make it really easy for you to consume. So if you're unfamiliar with that, it's the distributed application runtime, um, also an open source project, which can run on Kubernetes. But we bake that in in a really you know incredible way in container apps, which makes it really easy for you to essentially wire up your applications to talk to service bus or to talk to Azure storage, um, to talk to different secret stores, um, which is something we're in the process of working on today, Dapper Secrets. But 
all of that to say, it kind of abstracts away some of the, the plumbing code that would typically be in your microservice and instead offloads that to a dapper sidecar, which we manage on your behalf. So like, yes, like I think that we will see a ton of container apps adoption. I think we will see more and more uh, cohesiveness in terms of the Azure portfolio and how we allow customers to get that sort of like Azure functions experience, like within container apps, we have some similar, um, you know, overlap there with how they do event triggers and stuff. So, uh, that's where I see things going is continued uh, movement in that type of direction. Okay. I want to ask you about pricing, not, not on the high end where, it, cause I think anybody who has a really successful piece of software doesn't mind, you know, paying for, Hey, we got lots of, lots of money coming in. But, um, with app service, the, the free tier has always been there, but it lacks some of the features where like, if you want, if you want sticky sessions or web sockets or 64 bit, you know, you got to go to one of the, one of the paid tiers. Um, and, and so is that, is that the same or how, how, low does the pricing get for just if you're just by yourself but you want the fully featured environment not the free tier where you lack some features but what what's that what's that low end pricing model look like yeah so i can tell you where we are today i can talk about it at a high level and let me know if it answers your question and if it doesn't then i can definitely you know try to expound um but okay we don't have the concept of tiers today there is no okay. like free tier premium tier today right um what you get is uh, when you create a container apps environment, that's your only, there's only one kind today that you can create. It's just called a container apps environment, which it's sort of like, that's going to be where you, um, where you host all of the container apps inside of it. So it's kind of that boundary. It's a virtual network boundary around this set of, of apps that you create. Okay. Now, if you create like a not like, and once again, you get all the features that the platform provides. We don't like, there's no gatekeeping of any given features at this, you know, at this time. Okay. And then you could create a container app and by default, uh, it'll scale to zero. So when you, it, when you have no like HTTP requests, or if you're, uh, it's like a combination of HTTP requests. And then, um, I think it's like, a certain like memory or CPU threshold. I can't remember which one, but it, it's one of those two. So we take the combination of that. And once you, you know, you don't have any HTTP requests coming in, if it's an HTTP triggered app, or if you're like memory or CPU threshold, it, it's either one, it's one of those, but not both. I think if it falls below a th certain thresh threshold, your app will scale down to zero and you'll pay absolutely nothing. So like when your app isn't processing any requests, you pay zero. It's a consumption-based model though, right? So the, the second that you get a request or sure. maybe it's an event driven app. That's like a background process. That's going to get triggered by something. Queue. Queue, it's going to get spun up and then you get charged like cents per, like, I actually don't know, like off the top of my head, what the charge is for the, like the run rate. Okay. Um, but you get like a, a sizable amount of free requests per month. Right. So like, you'll have a threshold of like the num the first X thousand requests are going to be free a month. Um, like things like that. So you could hypothetically create a container app, apps environment. And if all of them scale to zero, you could have a, a state at which all of that's created and deployed and is co costing you zero dollars. Um, you could also have, you know, I, I don't have a, a good estimation of like, oh, if I ran this many CPU, if I ran this much processing in a, for a single month, what would that actually come out to? I don't have that. Um, okay. But what I can tell you is um, we don't have any like any like concept of gatekeeping certain features. Like if you today, if you want to use like VNet integration, for example, you can use that with the available model that we have today. Um, and the only like added cost would be things like, oh, well, you know, when you do integration, you're going to have like a load balancer that gets created. So like you'll have the charge of the load balancer um, for the, you know, private environment in your um, subscription. So like that'll be additional costs, but like th those capabilities and features don't, don't cost you anything. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, you said so many, so many thousand HTTP requests uh, is the spirit of it that a good number of developers should be able to build something before incurring, before incurring the runtime costs. Well, I mean, so yeah, well, when you're building and deploying, I mean, obviously you're going to do some iterative testing. So, uh -huh. so like you'll have some run rate as that, but yeah, I would say that for smaller workloads, like it's going to be a fairly uh, small cost, right? Like we're, de we're definitely trying to be, it's very competitive with other cloud providers that have similar capabilities like cloud run or some of these other things that you'll see in other cloud providers. 
Um, so it's going to be very competitive for serverless containers in terms of like looking at like industry-wide solution offerings, but let me see what the actual, so, oh, and I can also talk a little bit about idle usage, which I think is, is a good thing. So, um, if we look at like vCPU, uh, the active usage price is 0. 0.00024 per second. So, you know, take that as you will. For memory, it's 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0.00003 per second, I think. Four zeros? Uh, it's uh, on memory, it's five. So for VCPU, it was four. And then for memory, it's five. Yeah. I'm like, well, you know, it's not super meaningful when you're just looking at it this way, but we have a free grant of 180,000 VCPU seconds and 360,000 uh, like gigabits per second. Um, and of course, everybody extrapolates to the month. So if I multiply, yeah. does that, if I got the right number of zero, is that like $7 a month? Is that what it, if you were to have it on? I, I, on it, I don't make me do math on the spot. You're going to embarrass me. Um, <laughs> and then requests are 40 cents per million. 40 cents per million. Okay. So and with you the get idle, 2 million free a month, yeah. 2 million free requests a month. And if it's like, if it's like the, uh, the thresholds with every other Azure service, it's tended to be where if you're by yourself experimenting, just putting up an app so that you can run things around, you stay within those thresholds. That's yeah, kind of and it's going to be it's yes, you you will and I don't I don't know how many people are playing around with it and are hitting more than two million requests like you know per month. So yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely really I think it's cost optimized. I think there's some work we could do, and honestly, probably just someone else on the team can speak more intelligently yeah, no to this. But I will say um, another thing to consider is like okay, maybe I have an app that can't scale to zero, right? Like I don't really have that flexibility. It, mm -hmm. I, it's going to be scaling you know like crazy all the time. Or I don't want to incur a cold start because if you think of like Azure functions or really any serverless technology, when you scale all the way down and you scale back up, that initial uh, like that initial scale operation is going to like have some cold start. I don't remember what the current number is and I don't want to like get, give a number that's like either inflated or like under, um, under sure. representative. Um, but like, let's just say hypothetically it's 10 seconds. Like, let's say that that's initial right. cold. Start. Once again, that's an arbitrary number that I'm just like pulling, you know, pulling out. Well, of it wind. depends on our application. I mean, it's my, it's my startup logic. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And like, so yeah, that's something to consider. Well, like, let's say we just don't want to incur that cold start altogether. Like we just want to mitigate for it. So we do have the concept of like running a, an idle container app, which means basically if you don't take advantage of the scale to zero. You could, you know, set your minimum replica count to like one or two or three. So that means even when your app like scales all the way down, you'll still always have, you know, one or two or three instances of it, depending on what that number was that, that you set. Now we still have the ability to monitor the number of requests and the vCPU stuff like that. And if it, if it falls below that threshold, that would typically send it to scale down to zero. And it's at like its base scale, then we'll charge you an idle rate. So we still won't charge you like for an actively running app. We'll still charge you a lower fee. Nice. So when it's, so it scales down to zero, no cost idle, you know, idle scale. Um, I think you'll pay like, you know, the five zeros and a three per second to mm -hmm. run it idle. So you still get a really optimized cost model there. Right. Nice. It sounds like, it sounds like it, it's, it'll be more affordable for so many apps just because with app service, you pick your instance size and you, you tend to pick your instance size based on what you think you're going to need when people start yeah. using it. And then you add more instances as you scale, right. but very, I mean, there are some people that do it, but it's just a hassle to go back and say, oh, wait, okay, in the middle of the night, let me scale down to a really tiny instance size and then try to predict, oh, what time in the morning do we need right. to change the instance? Exactly. Because with, in, with adding an instance in app service, there's no downtime. But when you change the size of your instances, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's small, but I mean, you're you're kind of restarting and revisioning everything. Yeah, and when you look at like something like an AKS, like you're, you know, pre-allocating, you know, a set amount of compute, you know, and nodes and things like that. Um, but I will say like, one of the things that's challenging is like the consumption pricing model does require some level of knowledge about like your, like your expected load, because yeah. like, it is hard. Like, it's hard for me to be like, oh, your app's going to cost you X amount of like a month. Like, you know, that, that is hard. And it does put some of that 
responsibility on the customer to really understand like what their workload is. Um, and that's not to say that this will only be the, this is the only pricing model that we'll ever have, right? Like, I don't want to set that precedence here. I'm just kind of giving information about what's there today. Um, right. But I do recognize, you know, it's going to require some customers to like run some load tests or to evaluate, hey, in a given month, this is how many requests we typically see. This is how much CPU and memory we typically consume. Therefore, how could I, yeah. you know, cost optimize and take a look at what that would cost me in container apps? Well, it's architectural choices. If I if I have pre-provision uh, server capacity, then what 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 bad thing could happen if I get unexpected load? Well, my my application crashes because I've used up all server resources. Whereas yeah. if I leave an elastic service with no cap, uh, okay, it stays up, but I get a surprise bill. So yeah. it's kind of a choice of if this were to happen, what bad thing were to right, happen? Would right, you like, like the whole thing to crash? What's, what's worse? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> the whole yeah, thing like to what's crash worse, or like a bill? Support, support the scale that you need or, or, your, uh, or your paying for the kind of scale you actually need. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Well, awesome. As we uh, kind of get to our time and, and wrap up here, this is a, a huge topic, exciting topic for me and I think a lot of other people. Um, it, it, for those who really want to dig in, um, what, what kind of resources are available now i mean there's there's docs are amazing but are there like end-to-end sample apps where people can kind of grab an application and it has the scripts and they can just install what, what's available now that people can take advantage of that we can point them to yeah so depending on what you're interested in looking at i would recommend at least starting out with the azure architecture center we have two great samples um both i think really showcase the value of the product especially when it comes to like being a microservices hosting you know, platform. So they're microservice based applications. We have um, one application that uses Dapper and one that doesn't. So I think it kind of helps you understand the differences and how you can leverage Dapper if you're interested in that open source technology and how we brought that into the fold. Or if you're just like, hey, I just want to see how it would work with like a uh, an app that doesn't make use of Dapper and doesn't use some of that programming model. So uh, those are both on the Azure Architecture Center, and uh, obviously the samples are up on GitHub. So that has all of the like, hey. I can just literally run this script or run a few commands and get something really elaborate up and running quickly. And then we also, we have the docs um, page, but at the bottom of the docs page, uh, Brady Gaster, one of uh, my coworkers helped a lot with some samples. And so we actually have a samples page that links out to other samples that are like ready to run. And then I will say like, I love getting feedback from all of you on ways that we can optimize the kind of material we're putting out there. So I know I have a couple of samples I'm going to be uploading this week um, and that we want to link there. But I also want to start consolidating some of the samples that have been uh, contributed by the community that might not be super discoverable today um, because they're out there. They're just not necessarily all um, consolidated into one place. So right. That's an item I, I also have, but we, I will say someone in the community also put together like a really good YouTube channel that or not YouTube channel, but YouTube, um, playlist that has like 90 or so different video recordings that we've done at build that we've done. I know I've done a lot of talks and podcasts and things like that. And, and some of my colleagues have as well. So if you're looking to ramp up, if you want more of a baseline, if you want to talk more about some of the advanced capabilities, I know we didn't uh, cover all of that today, but there's definitely a lot out there for you to continue exploring. Okay. We'll make sure to get those links and include all of those in the show notes. For sure. Also, yeah. And also please uh, like join us on Discord. We have a great Discord channel where all of the engineers and all of the product managers interact directly with all of you. So it's a really good way to get your questions addressed, to work nice. with others in the community. Um, we also have a public uh, GitHub where we take all of like feature requests, issues that we you know try to be as responsive as we can be on that. So definitely share your feature ideas um, share any issues that you're facing and we'd love to help you walk through those, um, and be successful on the platform. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Kendall, that is a lot of information. I appreciate you yes. coming back on the <laughs> show and, and sharing the, what's, what's the latest with Azure container apps. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. And until next time, keep shipping. You've been listening to the Azure DevOps Podcast, a show for developers and DevOps professionals shipping software using Microsoft technologies. Go to www.azuredevops.show for show notes and other episodes. On behalf of your host, Jeffrey Palermo, and our sponsors, thanks for listening, and may God bless you.